Good morning, ECN family. Pastor Daniel here for our next week of uh, time together while uh, getting to spend a little bit of time together in our home and doing virtual services again this week. I uh, hope you all are doing well, and uh, I'm glad to be able to share in this Sunday morning with you. Uh, before we get started, I've got several things that are announcements this morning. One, uh, you can probably tell by looking behind me here in the sanctuary that things are looking a bit different. Uh, some of you have that ability where you have that eye for detail, uh, and you probably already picked up the color in the sanctuary looks different. Uh, our painters got out uh, the earlier portions or later portions of last week uh, and actually the from the gym all the way to the entry doors of the sanctuary have been recarpeted. They're finishing up some of that this coming week and can't wait for us to be back in the house together, uh, back here together at ECN and being able to show you all the things that have been going on. Uh, some of the new stuff just looks incredible around here. So whenever we get to be back together, it's going to be an awesome Sunday for you to be able to see some of the work that's been going on here uh, inside the sanctuary as well as inside uh, our main building here. Uh, a couple of things are going on we'll make sure that you're aware of. We have a meeting tomorrow night discussing uh, Easter plans, how we're going to worship uh, on Easter Sunday. I'd invite you, please be praying for our church leadership. Uh, there's a couple of different options that are on the table for us. Uh, we want to make sure that we provide the best opportunity possible for our uh, community of faith to be able to celebrate Easter together. And as we work through what that looks like, we'd appreciate your prayers in, uh, in that process as well. Uh, one other thing I want to make sure that you're aware of, our normal Easter Sunday offering that we do every year is coming back up again. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm wearing our uh, Easter t-shirt. I'm not sure I need to stand up a little bit there. There you go. Easter uh, here for Houston County. Uh, we firmly believe that this church is here for a reason within this community to be able to minister to the people that we do life with. Uh, whether we get to do ministry here on campus or not, or we're doing ministry within our own maybe neighborhoods, our own community, and uh, kind of family groups within our neighbors, uh, we take seriously that call that we're here for the people in our county and our community. Uh, and so I hope you're taking advantage of opportunities to be able to serve those people around you. But I'm wearing the t-shirt shirt because one of our initiatives was in many times in each year anyway uh, we as the church are oftentimes uh, accustomed to buying uh, Easter Sunday clothes uh, one of the things that we've pushed and been thinking about pushing especially this Easter anyway uh, is a, a bit of a, of a changing of the system so to speak because uh, we're not anticipating being able to gather in large groups and not anticipating being able to wear that Easter Sunday outfit that may Maybe we may have purchased and so uh, kind of calling the church to a place of instead of spending money on clothes for Easter Sunday this year maybe forgetting and uh, kind of bypassing some of that using those funds instead to go to the world evangelism fund something we've done for years here is every Easter our entire uh, amount given on Easter Sunday goes to the world evangelism fund which is a way for us to be able to spread the gospel around the world in a variety of ways uh, through the Nazarene denomination and so hey maybe this year that's an idea something that you like to do you're welcome to jump in on that as well uh, but it'd be an opportunity for us to be able to give to a very very worthy cause this coming easter now many of you have already begun giving through our PayPal app, or you've been mailing into the P.O. Box uh, number. Uh, if you don't know what those are, please feel free to give the church a call, give myself a call. Uh, you can email us at erinnazarene at gmail.com. We'll be happy to extend that information to you and make that uh, easily accessible. Uh, well, this morning we're going to be in Matthew chapter 21. Uh, I'd invite you, go ahead and turn to Matthew 21 if you haven't already. Some of you are aware of our uh, reading schedule, and uh, we'd invite you to go ahead and turn there. Before we jump into our passage, I want to take a moment to tell you a little bit of a story. When I was a kid growing up, uh, my dad worked for a company uh, that did a lot of technical work. He traveled a good bit. Uh, and in traveling a good bit, my mom also was working from home, not only taking care of me and my brother, uh, she also did some things on the side. She got into baking a little bit. And when I say a little bit, uh, I would say things got to a pretty high level of baking. Um, I can remember when growing up, even though my mom also worked a full-time job, uh, to make some money on the side as well, uh, her ability to bake cake cakes kind of became a, a bit famous in our area. Um, she would make cakes for anything from uh, bridal showers to teas to events, uh, birthdays, and even wedding cakes. Uh, I can remember many times our dining room table would be covered in cakes. Well, one of the kind of benefits to that, if you're a young man growing up uh, with a mom who makes cakes, 
was that my mom would uh, slice those cakes in little tiny squares. Uh, she would trim the edges and, and she would do so with a, a piece of string. I'm sure it was something more um, fancy or uh, specific than that, but to me it looked like a, just a piece of string that she used. She'd trim those outside edges and every time she did so, it would leave the smallest slivers of cake and she would discard those off to the side. Uh, she would pile those up on a plate and my dad and I called them cake scraps. I have no idea what the official verbiage is for that, but at night, my dad and I had a bit of a uh, tradition. At 10 o'clock and 10.30, an old show called The Andy Griffith Show came on. My dad and I would sit around and eat cake scraps with a glass of milk at night. It became a bit of a, uh, of a pastime of ours, if, if I would uh, uh, call it that anyway. In doing that, though, my mom's uh, cake making became kind of well known in our area. Um, people would call in advance, uh, they would order cakes a long way out. Uh, she built a ton of them, or made a ton of them I should say, and she became very, very good at it. Uh, I've only tried to make cakes a few times, uh, but it it always kind of failed to make the mark of what my mom could make. Um, I'm not really sure if she had some type of special ingredient. Uh, I used the same box that she used, uh, the same type of mix that she used, I used the same type ingredients that she used. But there was something about the cake that she made that always seemed to be so much better than my own. Um, I don't know if I'll ever make cakes as good as hers, but I continue to try from time to time. Uh, turn with me, Matthew chapter 21, and we'll spend some time in the text together. Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. And at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and colt and placed their cloaks on them, for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. We read this text together, and there's a few things that jump out at me immediately. Uh, some of the things are some pretty crazy details uh, when you think about the characters within the story. Not only do you have this beautiful story of Jesus walking into Jerusalem, or better yet, riding into Jerusalem, uh, the people that are waving palm branches, uh, the, the cloaks, the, the coats being put down in front of him for him to be able to walk on, uh, such an incredible picture. I, you know, I always kind of pictured that as it was portrayed maybe in Sunday school classes before, where there were maybe groups of 30 and 40 and maybe even 50 people who were participating in this at one time. It wasn't until later that I began to do a little bit more research and, and realized that in Jerusalem at this time, you're talking about the same time as the Passover feast was being celebrated. Um, some 30 years later, one of the governors uh, in that area uh, had a census taken, and one of the things they recorded was how many lambs were slain for the Passover festivities. And so 30 years after Jesus, we have record that there were nearly 250,000 lambs slain for this event. So just to give you an idea of how big this is, in the Jewish customs and laws, it was expected that there needed to be at least 10 people per lamb. Uh, there may have been more than that. So if you use conservative numbers based on the records we have 30 years after Jesus, you're talking about two and a half million people coming together. Uh, many who have studied, historians have studied, talk about millions of people being here for this. And so sometimes in our mind, we may picture a bit of a, of a smaller gathering or town looking somewhat smaller, but I need you to picture that this is a very large group of people in the city. Uh, we don't know exactly how many were there welcoming Jesus as he walked in, but the picture changes a great deal when you start thinking about multiple millions of people being in this setting in the same time of the story. Um, it doesn't quite look as small anymore as I look back on it now through a more realistic expectation of what Jerusalem would look like. 
regardless the picture of them uh, laying those cloaks down, waving those palm branches is still an amazing thing for us to look back at and see how our Savior rode into Jerusalem in a very different way than maybe the kings of their day. And there's a great deal to be learned from that. The thing about this Sunday, though, that really speaks to me, uh, the thing that I, I can't get my mind away from, are the two different people groups who are participating in the preparation before that great entry that we talk about on Palm Sunday. Uh, the first groups of those uh, are the disciples. It says Jesus sent two disciples um, into town, essentially, to find this colt and bring it back. When you picture a colt, sometimes we picture horses, but you need to know that some of the translations that we read use colt and foal interchangeably and it is a, a young donkey regardless is what we're talking about but he sends these disciples in there and, and I wonder sometimes what sorts of things were going through their minds um, can you imagine being the disciples sent by Jesus into town to go find this colt or foal to bring it back to him and their instructions are this you will go into town and you will find a colt tied um, untie it and bring it back to me and if the owner says what are you doing your response is the lord needs it um, i can only imagine the conversations that might have been going on between disciples because I, I kind of put myself in that uh in, in that scenario going what in the world are we about to get into they're walking toward town and, and the pictures in their mind are what's going to happen. I mean, what happens if the person says no? You know what I mean? What happens if they take the wrong route and they find the wrong cult? I mean, there seems to be a thin line between obedience to Jesus and burglary, quite honestly. I mean, in their minds, I, I can only imagine because of the way we read about the disciples in other places, how many questions that they must have had, uh, the things going through their mind when they get there. You have to think, though, by this point in the story, they start rationalizing and reasoning and thinking in the greater context of all the things that they've seen take place. Going into town to pick up a cult is really not that big of a deal. I mean, and when you go back, what, four chapters earlier in Matthew 17, and Jesus doesn't have the money to pay for a temple tax, and Jesus sends one of his disciples back out and says to, to find it out of, the, out of a fish's mouth. I mean, it's not the most absurd thing they've been asked to do. So as they arrive, you have to think in their mind at some point, faith begins to override logic. Um, faith begins to override what would be rational and reasonable in their minds. And they find it just as Jesus told them. Again, they trust God and it just seems to work out. It's amazing how, yet again, Jesus has asked them to do something outside the norm. He's asked them to do something that doesn't make logical sense. Another feeding of the 5,000, if you will. It just doesn't make sense. And yet, with Jesus, it seems to work out again. The other group of people that jump out at me are a, a couple, really, I'm, I'm supposing. Um, we don't know much about them. I wonder sometimes, what was it like to be the owners of the cult, the foal, um, the one that Jesus had sent his disciples to go retrieve. You wonder at what level did God speak to them? Uh, at what level did God communicate with them that this was okay, that the Lord needed it? I mean, we don't think within our reading of this text that there was any relationship with this group of people before. Jesus just sent his disciples down there. But think with me for a moment what it was like to be the owners of that cult. Um, I wonder sometimes what that was like. Did God reveal to an individual? Did he reveal to a, a family unit there? We would picture a family unit being there. And, and, and you wonder sometimes how that worked out. I mean, did Jesus or God reveal the plan to one of them? And one of them say maybe to their spouse, you know, honey, in a little while, a couple of men may be coming by to take the colt. Um, let them take both of them. Um, just let them go. And, and, and the response being, what do you mean they're coming to take the cult? I mean, for how long? What are they going to use it for? Who is coming to get it in the first place? I mean, you can only imagine the, the thought processes that went on before that. And yet, when the disciples arrived, it was okay that they were going to take it. Um, there was, again, a step of faith in, in this story. It seems to me that twice we have individuals or groups, small groups of people, if you will, that are following along with the plan that God had for them. Though it did not make sense and they couldn't see what was going to happen in the future, 
they both seem to be at peace with God's plan for their lives. It seems to be a little bit like the story we talked about last week, that there is a peace in not knowing how this is going to work out, but in having faith that God will make it work out. Sometimes in our faith, we picture people that we look up to, and we wonder sometimes how would we ever make it to be a person of that great of faith. You may have someone in your family, a matriarch, a patriarch, a, a pastor, a former pastor, someone that you've known for years that you look up to that is that person that you look up to in faith, uh, that you admire who they are. As you grow in faith, sometimes you put that person on such a pedestal, you wonder how in the world do you ever get to that place? Um, you wonder about these disciples. How do you get to the place that you trust Jesus enough to walk into a town, untie something that is not yours, and begin to walk back out with only the answer that if someone questions you about it, you're going to say to them that the Lord needs it. I mean, that's a, that's a great statement of faith. That the owners allowing that colt to be untied and walked away with is a great statement of their faith. And sometimes I feel like in our, in our, in our, Christian upbringing, we put people of, that we deem of, of great faith on such a high level, we wonder how we will ever get there. Almost as if we raise them to a point that we could never see ourselves being such a great person of faith. I want to remind you of something that we at ECN have talked about in the past. Um, saints are not born, they are made. Um, I want to say that again. Saints are not born. Uh, people of great faith are not born. They are made over time. Um, you look back at those individuals who made those great statements of those disciples who were willing to walk into town and trusting Jesus through that. They didn't just arrive at that day with this great sense of, of peace or faith going into town to accomplish this. Over time, they've trusted Jesus more and more. They've learned by trusting him with little things in the past that they can trust him with the things that may seem irrational. They've learned by taking smaller steps that they can now begin to take bigger steps. When you look at faith, sometimes we see it as some destination to have arrived at. In all reality, faith is a, is a journey process. It's something that we get better at by practicing it. It's something that, well, if you're gonna have the cake that everybody in the county wants to buy, you're going to have to make a lot of them. And you're going to have to learn along the way using the same ingredients that everybody else makes. You're going to have to, to learn through experience how to be the best at what you do. Every trade has that, has those small lessons that you learn along the way. Those small attentions to detail, the feel, the touch, those small elements that make, well, that really make you good at what you do. Faith is the same way. It's something to be worked at. You don't just arrive one day and you have the faith to trust Jesus and walk off and take some cult. You have to trust Him with the small things and then eventually you begin to trust Him with the bigger things. And then eventually you trust Him with everything you are, everything you have. You trust Him with who you're becoming and who you want to become. I'm not sure this morning what God is asking you to trust Him with next, but I know this. Every time the disciples went out on a limb, God was there to take care of them. He was there to show them something else about himself. He was there to do something else miraculous. So maybe this morning, God is asking you to take the next steps in faith as well. I hope you all have had a great week this week. I hope that life is going well for you and your family. I pray for you as the ECN family often, and I pray that you are staying well. I pray that this time that we have is something that will be soon passing. Our sign out front says, pray for the plateau. That is our church's call to pray for this illness, for the rise and increase in cases, for it to finally plateau so that it can begin on the descent on the backside. So maybe you would join with ECN family this morning and praying for the plateau. God bless and we'll see you next week.